are going to discuss a few more things about electro spinning and the electro spinning setup. Hmm. And then we will talk about uh, specifically electro spinning of pan because that is our um, you know important carbon precursor. Okay, so let's start with the um, some more parameters. You know, you remember how your electro spinning setup looks like, right? And you remember that um, some of the things that we talked about there are two electrodes. There is a certain distance between uh, the two electrodes. This distance, um, in the case of um, the traditional electro spinning, which we call only electro spinning, the far field electro spinning, you will have 10 to 12. So I had written 5 to 20 centimeter in the previous um, slide. In principle, yes, you can go between 5 and 20, but 10 to 12 is like the most common uh, or most uh, commonly used uh, distance between the two electrodes. Now, what is important here hmm, is that your setup can be both vertical or horizontal. So the one that I had shown you, I told you that, you know, so you had one this, uh, needle from this side, one electrode, you know, here, and then the flow of fibers. And over here, you had your screen or your collector. Hmm. Okay, so basically the fibers were, they were uh, fabricated horizontally, they were collected horizon horizontally. Hmm. Now we can also, why can't we have a setup like this where you have your needle on top and you have your collector in the bottom? Hmm. So it, the, the answer is yes, we do have indeed both kinds of setups and both have their own advantages and disadvantages, okay? So in the case of vertical electro spinning, what, what is your advantage? Um, the fact that you will have less wastage of fibers. Hmm. So whatever is coming out, you're able to collect all of those particles, uh, all of those fibers. Hmm. But there is also a disadvantage of the vertical setup. Hmm. The disadvantage is that you remember, so yeah, here again, I have shown you uh, in the schematic, when you have this horizontal electro spinning setup, in that case, you're only collecting the good fibers, let's say the thin fibers. Hmm. And if you have slightly thicker fibers, or sometimes you may even have droplets, you may, you know, because polymers may not always be perfectly uniform, the polymer solution. So if sometimes you have, you know, lumps of polymer, so you may end up getting droplets because of that. Those things will then fall on the way. Hmm. They will not be collected because of the gravity, they will already fall. But in the case of vertical electro spinning, you will have all of these things collected on top of your substrate. So in general, what happens is when people are uh, conducting research or they are doing experiments with certain new polymers and so on, they will use horizontal electro spinning because you don't know what are the optimum conditions, you know, and when do you get uh, droplets and when do you get good fibers. In the case of industrial processes or, you know, well established processes, however, you will use the vertical electro spinning setup. Because there, what is more important is that you don't end up wasting too, uh, you know, too much material. Hmm. Okay. So in any case, both of these uh, setups are are uh, widely used. Now, what you can also do is you can change the size or shape of your collector. Hmm. So till now, whatever I have shown you in the name of collector, that has been a, in a plate. You know, and this plate you can also attach a silicon wafer on top of this plate. Basically, you have a conductive plate. Hmm. But what you can also do is you can change the shape and size of this collector. What, how will that make a difference and why should you do that? Drum collector. This is uh, indeed a very common uh, collector nowadays. Uh, if you buy an electro spinning setup, you can actually buy these um, drum and disc collectors along with it. Hmm. So drum collectors are basically, they are rotating at, uh, so they are uh, cylinders of uh, metal. Hmm. So they are also, they are connected, they are your electrode number two, and then they are rotating at reasonably high speeds, you know, uh, let's say 2000 uh, rotations per minute. So what happens now? Now you're like winding the fibers. Hmm. And when you're winding it, winding it, especially when your drum is rotating with that speed, then you also end up aligning the fibers, hmm. which does not happen in the case of a simple plate collector. Hmm. Now, if you want to also position your fibers in, in a very, you know, let's say uh, a very thin or very narrow space, then you can use this disc collector. So disc also rotates, but you see it's more like a CD, a compact disc, and you know, you're just collecting the fibers at its edge. So now you have this very thin rope-like structure. However, again, you know that these kind of things you will only do, do for research purposes or for small scale fabrication. Not for industrial application, there you use the simplest uh, geometries because also your process is very much optimized. Hmm. 
Okay, so you can also design. So there are many other types of collectors also. These are the ones that are rather commercially available. You also uh, can design your own collectors. You have various types of stages nowadays. You can, um, all you need to do is, you know, sort of play with the electric field. Wherever you have your, um, your uh, conductive uh, collector, then the fibers will go and attach there. They will get attracted to it. You can also have, you know, to, to begin with, you can have collectors as simple as an aluminum foil. Hmm. So you will have, if you just want, you know, a large fabric like sheet, then you can just collect them also on any conductive foil. Hmm. So all kinds of collectors will, um, can be, can be prepared. Okay. Now, um, I have also written here and probably also I said it in the previous class that you can make your own electro spinner. Hmm. So I have nothing against the companies who are selling electro spinning setups. But at the same time, the whatever you need for research purposes, a small scale device can indeed be uh, prepared at the lab scale hmm. what you need to do you you need a high voltage power supply you need a good stage hmm. okay you may or may not need a good stage you can sometimes also just have two electrodes you know one needle syringe and then uh, any conductive substrate connected to the power supply and maybe you need a syringe pump that's all you need you can actually prepare your own electro spinning setup however please take care of all the safety precautions because you're working at uh, very high voltages Hmm. and um, you may get shocks and I have myself learned it the hard way hmm. so I would like to tell you that do make sure I think what is a good idea hmm, which I should have done also is that you you place your entire setup inside a good closed chamber hmm. and these chambers can generally be prepared uh, using uh, PMMA uh, sheets you know PMMA is polymethyl methacrylate you get these kind of uh, these uh, thick plastic transparent sheets and you can um, just do some laser cutting and make your own box hmm. and make sure that uh, the doors are closed when you are running the electro because you see um, you're working at pretty high voltages hmm. and uh, especially if you're working with conductive polymers you may also have some sparks here and there especially for when you're performing optimization of a, for a new polymer in that case um, there is a possibility of accidents so take care of all the safety precautions and uh, in the commercial electro spinners typically uh, the, the, if you open the door, then the voltage supply will, uh, the power supply will, will turn off automatically. So these kind of precautions can be, must be, um, you know, taken care of. Okay. What industrial uh, spinners also have is a multi-nozzle system. Hmm. Multi-nozzle means, so you, you can imagine that a nozzle is again your spinneret or your needle. Hmm. So you have, uh, if you want to perform or if you want to make really large sheets of electrospun fibers what you can have is you can have 10 nozzles hmm, and 10 syringes and 10 pumps connected to it so this is what indeed happens in the case of uh, large scale industrial fiber especially for carbon fiber fabrication because you need to then prepare le really large massive laminates in many cases hmm. or you need to also uh, braid the fibers you need to then further you need a lot of quantity of the fibers so in that case uh, you have one single collector, but you have multiple nozzles. Hmm. So this is also a variation of it. Okay. Um, yeah. So we already talked about the uh, electrical conductivity of the polymers. You also know that, um, you know, if your fiber connects the two electrodes, you may have some sparks. Okay. Um, so this is about, uh, this is generally about the electro spinning setup. And now let us specifically talk about the electro spinning of pan. So on this slide, I have uh, shown you a lot of chemical structures. Huh. These are actually several steps that, um, you know, that, that uh, take place, hmm, several uh, stages of the carbonization of pan. But before the carbonization, we also perform one more step in the case of pan. This is known as the stabilization step, and this is what we are going to talk about. Now, here you see, this is your starting material, pan. Hmm. What is interesting about it? So if you remember in some uh, some of the lectures, I said that if you have aromatic rings, hmm, if you have these six membered rings already in the polymer, then it is a good idea. Then then it is it will yield good and graphitic carbon. But in the case of pan, you see you don't have that cyclic structure. Hmm. It is in what is known as aliphatic uh, polymer. Hmm. OK, however, when you, you, you do get good quality carbon out of it. And the reason for that, this is why I'm showing all these uh, chemical reactions. The reason is that there is a certain cyclization takes place where your nitrogen atom behaves more of a, you know, as an intermediate structure or even you can call it a catalyst. Hmm. And then you have these, um, these cyclic structures forming at a certain, uh, certain time point and then you get good 
carbon which is which has graphitic content okay so now let's first think about uh, what is a pan when you want to start working with pan okay it looks like a white powder mm. when you purchase it um, the typical molecular weights uh, that you buy is uh, around 150000 but you can also get a higher molecular weight uh, pan mm. higher molecular weight will have a longer uh, chain length mm. that would change the viscoelastic properties so in case you need it then you can buy that anyway the typical parameters for the carbon, uh, for the electric spinning of pan are mentioned here you take this powder and you make a solution ha huh. and the solution is most common solvent for uh, dissolving pan is dimethyl formamide or dmf hmm. you may have to heat it up to 70 degrees uh, for a while to get a good solution so now you get this uh, solution of pan and um, then for electro spinning the parameters that you would typically use is 10 to 12 kilovolt hmm. that is your uh, voltage and you will also this concentration of the polymer solution is generally it varies between 5 and 15 Hmm. but you may also for for carbon again for industrial purposes typically it's 10 to 12% uh, solution weight by volume in dmf so this is these are some of the parameters that you will use for pan carbonization okay as i mentioned before the carbonization you will heat it in air between 240 and 350 degree centigrade why are you doing this you are doing this is the step which is known as the stabilization step mm. and over here now if you look at this diagram mm, or these uh, reactions you will see that you lose some water and oxygen mm. this is all of this is or there is uh, you know dehydrogenation at various uh, steps this this entire th thing is actually happening during your um, during your stabilization mm. so you do need some oxygen here this the dehydrogenation is what takes place during its um during the uh, uh, initial the the stabilization step hmm. okay after that so here also till here you you need you need oxygen once you get this kind of this kind of cyclic structure hmm, or longer sort of uh, it is you can call it further polymerization hmm. but then also you're changing the chemical structure a little bit but you get these kind of large structures then you perform the carbonization under the inert atmosphere and here you see at 500 degrees you have this kind of chemical reaction 700 something like this and then you get finally you get these large carbon structures where you have some nitrogen atoms until you know maybe even 900 degrees you will still have uh, nitrogen atoms in it and that is why in order to get rid of the nitrogen all the nitrogen pan fibers uh, for making the carbon fibers you will heat them um to a much higher temperature rather than 900 because you you will still have some nitrogen there okay now this entire strategy uh, was suggested by fitzer this is a very common uh, this is uh, still uh, the most extensively studied paper in this regard so this is a proposed mechanism of the carbonization of a pan hmm. and this is where you also see what happens during the uh, during the um, uh, what is it stabilization okay what else happens during stabilization this is what we are going to learn now but before that let me show you some pictures so this is how your uh, electro spun pan uh, mat looks hmm i think i had also sh uh, also shown this picture earlier if you stabilize it it looks something like this hmm so it looks a little bit of little brown hmm so if your mat uh, becomes brown don't worry you've not burnt it yet ha huh. so this is this is all right this is how the uh, you know stabilized mat looks and then when you carbonize it under the inert atmosphere this in this particular case uh, this was carbonized at 900 uh, degrees so this is how now your uh, you know mat now it converts into this carbon carbon fiber mat hmm. carbon fibers you can you would say that this looks a stiffer structure right? it's not as flexible as, as the uh, pan fibers yes in fact it's not as flexible but it is still flexible enough Hmm. so right now it looks a little bit stiff in this particular picture because compared you number one because you are comparing it with the pan fibers number two also there is no solvent there is also no there is at least a little bit of shrinkage so there is some um, you know the the structure is not as freely uh, you know it's not able to move as freely as before but if you take one little part of this mat hmm then you will see this one here hmm then you will see that it is indeed flexible enough 
and um, it depends on how you fabricate your structures how many layers do you want uh, in your fibers then you can also control the flexibility of your overall structure hmm. okay so i was talking about the stabilization step and what else happens there so you know that now um, you have certain oxidation and dehydrogenation steps that are taking place and there is also some water molecules there some water molecules and um, you know oxygen being produced as well hmm. This reaction of stabilization, so because of all of these, uh, you know, you have both of the certain reactions taking place and also certain byproducts are being formed. This is a diffusion controlled reaction. Hmm. When it is diffusion controlled reaction, that means you need, so if you increase the temperature, diffusion increases hmm, in general. So you basically need, if you keep on increasing the uh, temperature during your stabilization, then you will have a faster and better stabilization, but you are limited by the stabilization temperature because if you go above 350 degrees then you may end up um, either burning your polymer or you may end up melting it you may end up also deforming your fiber structure so you don't know even 350 is is uh, pretty high hmm. people even would uh, keep it below 300 in general so what is a good idea in order to avoid the damage to the fibers what you could do is you could just uh, heat it not at very high temperature so it has to be about 240 but you can keep it let's say at 270 or 300 you can keep it for a longer uh, for an extended duration rather than trying to do it quickly hmm. so if you do it basically if you do it slowly and for a long time then you will get better stabilization of your carbon fibers uh, of your uh, stabilized pan fibers hmm. okay now uh, these fibers once you have these stabilized fibers then you would convert them into carbon hmm. and that is done at a minimum temperature of 900 degrees okay at 900 still you do not have very um, you have maybe 97 percent carbon content in your carbon fibers if you perform the elemental analysis okay so what we also need to understand a little bit is this pyrolysis mechanism so i told you when we were talking about pyrolysis i told you that um, typically up to 700 degrees you will have the pyrolysis taking place hmm. and after that you will have carbon carbon bond formation and at some point you will at 900 you will get a reasonably good carbon network hmm. so you can work with that but then you f further increase the temperature then you get um, your more graphitic content and you get rid of all the impurities if you want to get um, you know pure graphite you will go all the way to 3000 degrees and you have to have a graphitizing polymer not all polymers will give you graphite okay so what happens in the case of pan and can we actually do what do we know about the pyrolysis of pan given it's such a common polymer hmm. and also things that we know about pan can they also be applied to other polymers hmm. okay so what we can do is you place these fibers inside the furnace and as in these pictures you can see you take them out at um, you know, so this is after stabilization. However, then I heat treat it for up to 400 degrees and then I take the sample out. Then I heat treat it at 500 degrees. I take the sample out 600 and so on. Hmm. Or even I can have, you know, at every 50 degrees, I can take the sample out. There will be some rearrangement of bonds and certain chemical reactions, certain annealing of um, byproducts during the cool down also. But ignoring that, if I just take these materials and try to understand their properties, their, uh, you know, elemental purity, their electrical conductivity, their mechanical properties, then we can get some idea about, you know, what's happening um, in the, during the pyrolysis. Hmm. Okay. So these materials, I would call them pan carbon inter intermediate materials because they are neither pan nor carbon. Hmm. So they are definitely not carbon. Uh, even if you say, high purity high in carbon with high impurities even that is not correct it's better to not call them carbon sometimes people use the term char for these kind of materials but we um, don't want to give the impression that this is uh, formed by coking or charring huh? so in order to avoid any confusion we just call them intermediate materials okay um so it seems by i will show you um, you know one plot on the next slide it seems that most of the properties undergo a very sudden change around 700 degrees for uh, for polyacrylonitride. Hmm. What does that mean? Um, you will have a lower electrical resistivity. The pan is insulating, huh? so the material material remains pretty much insulating. Maybe the electrical conductivity increases a little bit as you increase the carbonization temperature uh, or pyrolysis temperature. However. At 700, you will see a sudden jump in electrical conductivity. So the materials that are, um, you know, prepared 
at temperatures higher than 700, you can call them electrically conductive. Before that, you will still have them in the insulation, in insulating material range. Hmm. Similarly, for the mechanical properties, the material will be very soft, but then suddenly it becomes stiffer hmm. at 700. Of course, this stiffness and also the electrical conductivity is not very good, very high at 700. And in fact, if you keep on increasing the temperature, you will then get further, um, you know, increase in crystallinity and therefore the properties will also improve. But from this, you can understand, the, understand that there is some big change is happening in the material at around 700. And what is this change? Most likely, this is where you are getting rid of all the non-carbon atoms. Hmm. Because initially, you lose some atoms, you lose some oxygen, you lose some nitrogen, you lose. But hydrogen leaves later, hmm, around 600 degrees. But then hydrogen is also leaving um, also the remaining nitrogen uh, in the case of pan. Most of the uh, of the hetero atoms now we get rid of them at around 700. I'm saying most of them, not all of them, but you know, you basically have a sudden release of byproducts just before the 700 point, and also you are now you now have sort of a skeleton, hmm, your carbon skeleton prepared or carbon network you can call it. That is what you now have at 700 degrees now. You're doing the further heat treatment um, just for getting higher crystallinity and higher purity. So as mentioned, this is the uh, this is one plot. You can see here this is uh, approximately 700, hmm. and this is these these are the materials um, which are the intermediate pan carbon materials, and these are electrical properties. This is electrical resistance. And this is the pyrolysis temperature. You can also plot mechanical properties and other properties. What is interesting is also for other polymers, maybe the temperature is not exactly 700, maybe it's 650 in some cases, 720, something like that. But um, for many polymers, uh, this is pretty much what you get. Hmm, this is uh, the between 600 and 700, you will have this sudden change in uh, properties. Hmm. So keeping in mind that also furnace is not, um, you know, the, the, these experiments were performed in the lab furnaces uh, where you even the furnace uh, display 700, maybe it is 696, hmm, something like that. So minor error is possible, but this is just to give you an idea that this is uh, number one, this is what happens uh, for pan. And number two, this is one uh, method of understanding the mechanism of pyrolysis. Hmm. Okay. In the case of carbonization of pan, there are a few more, um, you know, important things, hmm, especially when we talk about the carbonization aspects. If the fibers are ultra thin, hmm, ultra thin means less than 20 nanometer thin. Hmm. These kind of fibers, they are often, um, they can be carbonized at a lower temperature. This is not just the case with pan, but any polymer. Hmm. When you have uh, very small structures, but this effect of structure is only visible or only uh, at least dominant when you have structures that are smaller than 20 nanometers. So extremely small structures, if you carbonize them, they can have uh, both byproducts and defects and yielding out very easily. Hmm. So the uh, because of their high surface area. But as I mentioned, this is it does not happen in micro scale. This is often the case only at the nano scale and especially fibers that are smaller than 20 nanometer. So in this case, you may get, um, you know, higher graphitic content at 900 itself. Now, one more interesting question arises is, um, is pan graphitizing or non graphitizing type of uh, polymer? Hmm. What kind of carbon does it give? Hmm. You actually for the industrial carbon fiber fabrication, if you want to get a higher graphitic content or if you want to call them graphite fibers, then you will still use mesophase pitch and you will not use polyacrylonitrile. In general, polyacrylonitrile is, um, is a non-graphitizing type polymer. Mm. However, there have been certain uh, publications where people used uh, uh, certain stress mm, from the beginning or certain additives in the material or even very high temperature special treatments can yield graphite like crystallites at the end hmm. but that is um, that is only when you have uh, specific uh, specialized treatments in general pan is a non graphitizing polymer but we do not say that this is um, the fibers that we have are glass like carbon fibers or graphite carbon fibers or non graphitizing for that matter for uh, for a couple of reasons number 1 uh, in the case of fibers, as I said, that the defects can anneal out um, in, in, easily. 
relatively easy. So you cannot always say that um, you are going to never get graphite out of it. Hmm. Although under normal circumstances that does not happen because there will be some curved carbons that are formed. There may be some fullerene like structures, although in the case of fibers, it is um, less likely hmm, because they again, because of especially when you have fibers as thin as 20 nanometer, then it is possible that these defects will anneal out. However, there will be some curved carbon structures. Hmm, so this is more of a non graphitizing type carbon and that is why you should not get graphite out of it. But we also don't know exactly what's the mechanism of carbon carbonization. Do we call it coking and do we or do we call it charring? That is also so mostly it is coking process. Mm. But you see in the case of pan you have this cyclization going on. Mm. This is more complex mm, compared to most of the uh, other methods. So you do not really um, very you do not specify what kind of uh, whether it is a coking uh, mechanism or charring mechanism you just call the fibers that come out of it as carbon fibers one thing we do know is that um, we do get a high carbon content in your um, in the fibers that come out of it hmm. okay um, so there are some other things about carbon fibers what happens at low temperature so low temperatures in this in the industrial case you you will call low temperature um, 900 is a low temperature hmm, for industrial processes Mm, okay, because in industrial scale, we are anyway not uh, making fibers smaller than 20 nanometer or so we have large enough fi fibers and um, that is why you um, you do not get good much graffiti content at 900 and you would typically go for higher temperatures. What you can do if you want to get some graffiti content again that would uh, be mostly for research purposes rather than uh, for industrial applications. What you can also do is you can have some additives. Mm, so you can have metal nanoparticles. You can also have certain carbon additives like you, you can add carbon nanotubes in your polyacrylonitrile solution. In the case of polyacrylonitrile, it's relatively easy because you're preparing a solution from a powder. At that time, you can also have some additive. Of course, you will have to optimize the concentration so that the uh, material does not lose its spinability, so to say. Mm. So you can add in these pictures, you can see that uh, we added some carbon nanotubes into pan and then spun fibers out of it and then carbonized this, uh, this entire thing again. So this material actually becomes your sort of a carbon carbon composite material. What is the advantage of this entire process? I don't know if it is clear in these pictures, but if you can see over here, the regions that are close to the nanotubes, mm, they show more graphitization because of this templating effect. Hmm. That is um, that you can do to improve the uh, graphitization. So we also see them in the uh, transmission electron uh, microscope images and we also can do electrical conductivity measurements. So you will typically if you have higher graphitic content, you will have higher electrical conductivity. So depending upon your application, so for sensing applications or also for um, gaining more mechanical strength, you, you can test different properties. What do you want from your uh, uh, fibers? Hmm. One way of increasing graphitic content is also this, um, you know, addition of uh, either graphitic carbon nanomaterials or of course you can also have um, this catalytic graphitization where you can have metal nanoparticles, hmm, for example, iron. In that case, you will need to get rid of this iron or whatever metal afterwards hmm, from your fibers. So you will have to perform such certain leaching uh, experiments, etc. Hmm. But the, there are certain methods of improving the graphitization in pan fibers. Okay. However, as I have mentioned before that for the industrial um, uh, graphitic or graphite fiber fabrication, hmm, again, graphitic and graphite, graphitic is the content of graphitic crystallites in a typically in a disordered carbon material. Huh? Then you, as long as you can detect that peak of the graphite hmm, in XRD uh, or any other spectroscopic or diffraction um, analysis, then you can call it graphitic. However, graphitic does not mean that there is any given fraction of crystallites. Hmm. So it can keep on increasing and that is why you will say that the graphitic con content keeps on increasing at higher temperatures. This is valid for all carbon materials, not just fibers. Hmm. But non-graphitizing would mean that it will never convert into perfect graphite. Hmm. So that is what we have with in, in the case of pan fibers. You have this is non graphitizing, but it does get higher and higher and higher graphitic content 
as you keep on increasing the pyrolysis uh, or heat treatment temperature or if you increase uh, or add for example carbon nanotubes or you induce stress or with other methods you can um, these are some of the articles that you can read you can find them on the internet there are ways of getting a very high graphitic content in hand derived fibers okay so there are uh, as i mentioned now you can um, you can read more about it this is um, this is an area where you have overwhelming amount of literature you can find several books even um, several research articles several, several review articles on carbon fibers electro spinning and pan derived carbon fibers specifically so um, this is one paper which i uh, this this is a paper from where i took that mechanism um, image and um, there are many other papers um, so if you're interested you can read more about it